You're watching episode 99 of Anglican Unscripted, where four guys sit down in their chairs at their computers and talk about all things Anglican. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And today's May 14th, 2014. George, you and I will never be stymied for the lack of Anglican news. We are smart enough to go into other types of news, and we're going to talk this week about diplomacy. Um, there's been an effort uh, amongst people here in America and around the world to fight terrorism and uh, radical Islam using what we call social media diplomacy. And when I say that, I'm going to give you the example here of our wonderful uh, uh, Mrs. President, uh, Michelle Obama, uh, with this hashtag, Bring Back Our Girls. And what she's referring to are the uh, uh, 300 kidnapped Nigerian schoolgirls uh, who three or four weeks ago were kidnapped by the Boko Haram. And uh, Michelle Obama and many other celebrities and people around the world believe that bringing attention to this uh, and educating you through social media via hashtag will have an influence on bringing back these girls. And I want to bring to light the reality of social media and diplomacy and how it doesn't work. And we can best do that by going back uh, about four, three or four years now and talk about Coney 2012. Well, I guess that's two years ago, 2012. Gee, Kevin, do your math. Um, Coney 2012 was a wonderful, emotional video put together by a, a, a Christian who had visited uh, Uganda and uh, learned about Joseph Coney and all the atrocity he he's caused uh, Uganda for the last 20 years, kidnapping children, using them as slaves, and he put together this heart-wrenching video. Here is how we're going to make him visible. We are going to make Joseph Kony a household name, not to celebrate him, but to bring his crimes to the light. And we are starting this year, 2012. We are targeting 20 culture makers and 12 policymakers to use their power for good. And he started hashtagging uh, Kony2012. And this video got eight, nine million hits. It raised $30 million. And people around the world said, we can now have an influence through social media to stop an evil person like Joseph Kony from doing what he's doing in Uganda. And George, as we know, uh, two years later, we sent a, a, a battalion into uh, northern Uganda. We assassinated Joseph Kony, and uh, it worked. That didn't work, did it? <laughs> no, no, it didn't. <laughs> After catching the world's attention, uh, the Obama administration sent eight communication specialists to help the Ugandan army get their radios to work. And Joseph Kony is still in the jungles of uh, the Central African Republic, uh, South Sudan, Uganda. His depredations still continue. See, what if, if Michelle Obama really wanted to get the girls released, she wouldn't hold up a sign and tweet and Twitter. She'd roll over in her bed at night and tell her husband to do something. She, in other words, the whole social media campaign is to convince governments to take action. And if the wife of the president writing a sign in the White House can't get the government to take notice, who can? And Kevin, governments act out of self-interest. Joseph Kony, Boko Haram are evil people. Mm -hmm. But frankly, there's no self-interest in the United States of tracking down Boko, of Joseph Kony in northern Uganda. There is an interest by it indirect in stamping out Boko Haram because Boko Haram is a local affiliate of Al Qaeda. They're being uh, funded and financed and armed from weapons taken from Muammar Gaddafi's armories in Libya. They're seeking to overthrow uh, the Nigerian government, making an Islamic state and cut off the oil. So in our economic self-interest, we don't want that. We rely on Nigerian oil. Western Europe relies on Nigerian oil. But for the United States, so long as they keep killing each other in northern Nigeria, it's not a big deal 
to our national strategic interest. Now, that's very harsh. It, it is That's harsh. not the way it should be, but that's how governments operate. Well, And try to change governments to be sort of lovey-dovey. That's what got us into the jungles of Vietnam. Well, it's just not in our interest. It's not. And it, people forget history. It, it took a long, long time for us to be pulled into World War II. We were letting Hitler do everything he did. We knew the rumors about what, what, what was happening to the Jews. It took Japan to get us into World War II. And, and, Kevin, and there's a, a great, I, I don't want to use the word hypocrisy because that's too strong, but since there's a great deal of fuzzy thinking. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, Johnson Tom with the Archbishop of York. He has long. He was vociferously opposed to Britain and the U.S. getting involved in taking down Saddam Hussein. He said, "You know, there's not direct evidence of nuclear weapons. We just don't need to get involved in this war. War should not be the answer. That should be the last resort, not the first resort." However, because of Iraq's actions and Iraq's oil and our self-interest and having a stable Middle East, we went in. Johnson Tamu has been calling upon Western forces to depose Robert Mugabe, who is just an evil as a dictator as Saddam Hussein was. Without the nukes. <laughs> but without the nukes and without the oil. Yeah. So how often have you heard the American government saying, we're going to go take out Robert Mugabe? Never, no. because it's not in our interest. But war is okay in, for Mugabe, for Johnson Tamu, but not for Saddam Hussein. Well, the, it, it's it, in other words, there's not a lot of clear thinking there. Well, there's also this misperception that if we could only educate these people, they would understand um, the problem. If, if 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 Adolf Hitler were really educated about the Jews, he would never have tried the genocide. Um, if, if Joseph. Um, um, uh, Kony knew about the, the Christians in Uganda, he would never be fighting this war. Uh, education and, 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 and communicating the truth about people is the answer. I think, is that not what Catherine Jefford Shorey said the answer is to this? Oh, Catherine Jefford Shorey had a really dopey statement. I'm sorry, it was just dopey. dopey. That the problem of Boko Haram is a lack of women's education in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> the problem with Boko Haram is that they want to exterminate Christians. They're not in favor of Western education for anybody, no. girls or boys. Boko Haram is the Hausa word, meaning books are haram, forbidden. Yes. The Western education is forbidden. Yes, there should be more education in northern Nigeria. But no, it's not as simple. If these girls were only educated, then their families would see that Boko Haram is not necessary because deep down, we're all good people. See, Catherine Jefford Shorey is, a, is an Episcopal version of Blanche Dubois from Streetcar Named Desire. In other words, I just rely upon the kindness of strangers. <laughs> now, now, I'm, now I'm, being, I'm being goofy now, but what I'm trying to say, it speaks to a theological belief that inherently all people are good, that there is, that evil doesn't exist. People do bad things because they're crazy. I don't believe Adolf Hitler was crazy. I believe he was evil. Yeah. I don't believe Saddam Hussein was crazy. He was evil. Yep. And, and, and that, we are a fall, and evil is going to exist until Christ comes again. We live in a fallen, broken, evil world, and mankind is inherently corrupt. Uh, yeah, I hate to, to, you know, you guys remember the Khmer Rouge, the Pol Pot's people? Um, those were French college educated st uh, students who uh, brought about that revolution. I, 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 Kevin, Kevin. College educated, not necessarily the same thing. They can go to college and they can have an education, but are they educated people? No. I speak as someone with two daughters about to enter the university system. I, I have a junior in college, and uh, the, it, it took no time to liberalize her with with their ways. Um, but the reality is, education is not the answer here. We're dealing with evil, and uh, evil can be educated evil. Um, who was it? I, I have a Kevin. You remember, I, I'm going to jump in. Do you sure. remember when we had 9/11 and Frank Griswold and the Episcopal Church's House of Bishops came out with all these goofy statements saying, you know, we need to understand the poverty that has driven these terrorists to attack us. Well, these are college Western-educated engineers, chemists, pilots yes. who've 
Yes. Mate who carried out the 9 11 attacks. The leaders are Saudis. Yeah. These are not poor people from the slums of Algiers or the Casbah. These are, you know, chill, middle class, well educated people who had all the education that Catherine Jeffrey Shorey could ever hope to achieve for an African girl. Yet they went and they committed an evil act. The current leader of North Korea was educated in Switzerland, has a four year degree. I don't know if they offer a four year degree in totalitarianism, but he has a, you know. It, and, and Kevin, Harvard University is holding satanic rituals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so evil is what evil is. I think it was Edmund Burke, I have the quote here. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And when you hold up a hashtag, bring back our girls, uh, it's like ha holding up a hashtag, uh, give back our churches um, to tech. It isn't going to work. It is hashtag or social diplomacy. It is bound to fail. Um, let's finish up the segment with um, somebody who has dealt with the Boko Haram, who has helped with negotiations, who got nowhere, who can't use the Boko Haram on his resume. What does Justin Welby say about the Boko Haram, George? That they're irrational. Mm -hmm. He's politely saying they're crazy. Yeah. You're not going to convince these guys through peace talks in Paris uh, with little bottles of mineral water stacked in front of each side that they it's in their interest to lay down their arms. They will only negotiate. They will only stop the fight when they run out of bullets and they feel that their enemy is stronger than they are. Right now, the Nigerian government is weaker than they are, and they're going to continue the fight. Uh, that was quite a report we did uh, about all social media, George. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, I just keep singing that John Lennon song in the back of my head. Uh, all we are saying is give, give peace, peace a, a chance. chance. Yes. And I wish I had a lighter, then I could just light it and wave it slowly back and forth. I'd set off the sprinklers. But, uh, that's right. And little uh, peace symbols. You know, uh, one big report we did, social Kevin, media. Yes. The people united will never be defeated. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Oh, the 70s. But thank are back you, again. Jesse Jackson, for keeping that <laughs> mantra in my head. On to other news. Let's talk about uh, uh, some England news, uh, some British news. Uh, the We heard reports this week that the uh, Times of London have uh, laid off, or Ruth Gledhill has retired from the Times of London, where she was a reporter for 27 years. And when George and I hear stuff like this, we kind of know the backstory. The big backstory is there's no money in religion news anymore. Uh, you work as a uh, part-time reporter for the Church of England newspaper. Uh, you work for Get Religion. You are not very well paid. Nobody is well paid if they're a reporter for religion. And that's just the reality that it is that if there were money in this, Ruth Gledhill would still be employed at the Times. That's the way Ruth? it is. Ruth Gledhill, for 27 years, has been the religion correspondent for the Times, and she was the last full-time religion correspondent. Mm -hmm. The Daily Telegraph has somebody who does religion and culture, but that's not the same thing. The, the Guardian got rid of their religion reporter. The Independent never had one. Um, it marks the end of an era, and it is a tragedy on, on several levels. It's a personal tragedy. Mm -hmm. You and I, I've known Ruth Gledhill for going on 15, 17 years. You've known Ruth five, seven yeah, years. Yeah, seven, absolutely. Yeah. She's a delightful person. Mm -hmm. I've, stayed in her, I've stayed in her home. I've met her children, her husband. They're, she's a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. and, and so for her to have her job disappear um, is a tragedy. But it's also a professional tragedy because Ruth Gledhill set a professional standard for other journalists to follow. When you've got somebody who's good in your profession, you want to emulate them. You want to be as good as they are. You, at least you try to be. And with Ruth Gledhill gone, I guess there's only me. Uh, <laughs> for people to aspire to. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being silly when I say that, but Ruth Gledhill was a craftsman in the in the old old sense of the word of someone who took a story and honed it and refined it and not only had impeccable sources and a depth of knowledge of her profession and her beat but had a gift of being able to write beautiful prose and she also had a bs meter 
uh, she knew right away when Lambeth was putting on a pr uh, press release what was BS in it and what wasn't BS in it. And she was also able to land the interviews. She got uh, great interviews views with N.T. Wright, with the Archbishop of York, the Archbishop of Canterbury's, uh, the last three or four of them. And, you know, that was something that she was able to do. Um, she also was able to post video uh, photos of uh, Archbishop Justin Welby in running shorts. Uh, George and I have been trying to get an interview with the, art, the new Archbishop of Canterbury for months now. It just doesn't happen because his diary is full. But when Ruth Gledhill called, you, you tried to make room in your diary because uh, she had a, a audience and a little bit of influence on uh, the Church of England. Now, what happens now? Well, there's nobody now to challenge the press releases from Lambeth or 815 or other places uh, in England. That, that voice of challenge is gone now, George. There's, and there's nobody with the institutional memory who knows. Um, oh, for instance, uh, I'll give you a little example. A press release came out the other day from Lambeth Palace announcing the appointment of a bishop uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it said, the Reverend Canon Doctor so and so has been appointed Bishop of Gibraltar in Europe, and I wrote to the uh, uh, press officer at Lambeth Palace and I said, "So when did you guys drop the style books? <laughs> you don't call people Canon Doctor. That is a mistake." Yes. And why do I say it's a mistake? Well, Crawf Crockford's clerical directory has a section in the front how you refer to and address the clergy that has been used since the beginning of time. And the guy uh, at the at uh, the guy at Lambeth Palace who I contacted knew, you know, made a joke of it because he didn't write the press release. But the pros are all disappearing and you have people who with no knowledge of how church writing and reporting is done now doing writing and reporting both from a PR side so you get these press releases with obvious mistakes in, in in uh, the way things people are referenced, one of the things I can't stand, this is a little pet peeve of mine, is when you refer to Bishop Tim. Yes. A, <laughs> now, whenever I hear Bishop Tim, I think of that scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where you have Tim the Enchanter. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, you know, John, you know, John Cleese comes with a little, he's got his little ram's horn hat and the flowing beard, and he's, and what is your name, O Enchanter? Some call me Tim. Tim. And the point is that it's supposed to be absurd. Somebody, you know, with a, an enchanter called Tim. Whenever I hear, hi, Bishop Tim, uh, Archbishop Justin, you know, we're not Greek Orthodox where we use first names like that. No. It's just ridiculous, but there's no collective memory that's older than a year or two to realize the styling is just inappropriate. There, I've had my rant. Oh, you did. You did. Well, that's a journal. That's inside journalism. <laughs> but there's that reality. With Ruth gone, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. There, there's the reality is there's no money. You know, George and I have to beg for donations when we want to travel. Um, it shouldn't have to be that way. We can't get a lot of advertisers because there's not a lot of Anglican video advertisers that have pre-made video commercials. It's the reality of the times. And uh, I think, you know... Uh, We've discovered the layoffs at Time Magazine, the Cutting of Life Magazine, all these places where journalism is no longer a, a, a field to go into. Um, it's the new reality. The Internet uh, is a, a body of work that has replaced journalism. And it's the way it is. It's the way of the future. And if your son or daughter says, I want to be a writer when I grow up, uh, you got to steer them a different way, George. Send them to uh, mechanic school. Yes. Across the pond. What time is it over there, Peter? It's about half past six half in the evening. Half past six on a Saturday, and you're willing to sit down with me and talk about all the news from the Jersey Shore. Now, it's time that I'll put the kids to bed. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the bishops of the Jersey Shore. Um, yeah. We have to go back in a little background. There's been a dispute because a person made an accusation about harassment. Apparently it was never followed through. They've issued reports to figure out what went wrong. 
and deciding what went wrong. There was a cover-up. The cover-up's always worse than the actual crime. Bring me up to speed. <laughs> um, yeah, so right back in 2008, mm -hmm. a vulnerable adult in uh, Jersey, that's the island of Jersey, south of England, which is not part of the United Kingdom, it's a separate country, all this kind of stuff, we've done all that before. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, England is here, France is here. Yeah, uh, be Caroline's sort of stuck in there. Right, be but yeah, in be between sort of... Because you're there. because you're really close to France, you're really safe because France never invaded anybody. So, you know. No, but but in but but the, the Channel Islands were occupied by Germany during the Second right. World War. But anyway, anyway, this vulnerable person, known only as H. G., mm -hmm. uh, claimed that she was um, abused in some way, not not physically, sexually, but emotionally abused by a church warden in Jersey. She took that complaint to the dean, a guy called Robert Key, who uh, used to be the head of CPAS, mm -hmm. which is one of the big church patronage, evangelical church patronage societies here in uh, England. And he kind of said, well, I'll try to do something about it, but in the end, I need a formal complaint from you if you want to take it further than the sort of informal stuff that, that I did. That formal complaint never actually happened, or did it happen? It's unclear. But essentially, it was kind of finished off in the manner it was this lady then proceeded to harass the dean and the and the then bishop of winchester a guy called michael scott joint who some of your uh viewers sure. will yeah. know uh to the extent that when when the bishop was visiting jersey staying at the dean's house she actually sent a very threatening letter or phone call to the house so much so that the police were called she was arrested remanded and then eventually uh, bound over to leave the island it doesn't stop there though after that, she pursued the bishop harassing him in Winchester so that an injunction or some of some kind was taken out against her uh, so that she couldn't come near Winchester. Then, when the bishop retired, she, she eventually found out where he had retired to, his home, and went to see him there. And when the new bishop of Winchester, Tim Dakin, was in place, I, my own understanding is that she also sort of harassed him about it. So basically, this is a very disturbed, vulnerable individual writes her own blogs told some of her stories it's very you know it's it, it's not a nice life but but she's a very disturbed vulnerable individual at the center of all this uh at one, and now at one point even canterbury got involved yeah so backtrack a year or so bishop tim dakin the new bishop of winchester um commissioned a report uh jan corris who's like a uh, psychologist or something did a report it was meant to be a report that basically looking into what had happened and and extracting learnings from it yeah you know which is what what organizations do all the all all the time something's gone a bit wrong let's find out what what went wrong so we can do it better next time what then happened was that that turned into a um, a public attack on the dean. The dean was suspended, and then unsuspended because there were real legal issues. Because Jersey is a separate country, and the dean is a, is a crown appointment. God bless her Majesty. Um, can't suspend the dean unless you're the you're the queen. So all these kind of things happened. And then there was this another report commissioned. This time, not by a sort of psychologist, but by a high court judge, Dame Heather Steele. Okay. A QC, which is basically you, your Canadian views and your British views will know what that is. Your American views just think one kick-ass advocate. Okay, <laughs> Co commission uh, uh, run by Dame Heather Steele, mm -hmm. who gave her report to the bishop back end of this year, not into last year. Who then sort of said, "Oh, this is I, I've I've had a legal complaint from from somebody, so I can't release it, and we need to check all that out." Okay. My understanding is I'm told it was delivered last Friday at 5 p.m. to the Bishop of Winchester. Okay, at 5 p.m. I thought it was supposed and, to be delivered publicly. Well, no, no the, the, the terms of reference say yeah. that upon receipt, these are the, 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 the exact words, upon receipt of the report, the Bishop will give her a copy to the Dean of Jersey, to the Bailiff of Jersey, who's like a cross between the, the the Attorney General and the Speaker of the government, and to the Ministry of Justice on Jersey, and they'll also give give a copy to anybody against whom many charges are going to be laid. The uh, it seems that no no charges are going to be laid, but the Bishop ha doesn't doesn't seem to have done that. The Bishop has said it has written a letter 
to the um, to the bailiff in Jersey. This was on the BBC News in in Jersey. And what happened was that this letter seems to have gone out to a lot of journalists and and, and a few bloggers. Uh, and my understanding is the bailiff wasn't very happy about that that this letter was sent as a confidential letter, uh, but it got sent also to to sort of journalists and, that's, and bloggers. That's so weird. Never happens. And, and and apparently the bishop saying, "Oh, I've got to check this with some lawyers about defamation and blah blah blah." Well, I've just literally got off the phone with a very senior source in the Jersey sort of government, uh-huh. and they're basically saying that the, the, there's been a communication back to the bishop, which basically says the terms of reference say that, that as soon as you get it, we get it. So damn well handed over. Huh, well, my understanding is, is, is that you know talking to Lee, they're they're also talking to lawyers about it. Sure. You know, and the whole thing could be just getting really, really messy. And, and here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing I don't get. I've got two questions, okay? I've got two two questions about it. Firstly, given that this report has been written by a high court judge, why does it need to go to lawyers to be checked for defamation? What is uh, the only person who's being defamed there is Dame Heather Steele, okay? The only person at that point who you're going, somebody's doing something wrong here, is Dame Heather Steele. She's a high court judge. She's a, she's a QC. She is, as we said, a kick barrister, sure. okay? She knows what she's doing. The very notion that she will write a, re- a report that is defamatory is just insulting to her, personally, I think. The second question is, though, and this is a deeper question, question given that the channel islands agreement between winchester canterbury and the channel islands which i leaked on my website earlier this week given that that it hands over all episcopal functions all ordinary functions to the bishop of dover with regard to guernsey and jersey given it does that what is the bishop of winchester still doing with a disciplinary process to do with jersey because the, 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 the Episcopal authority at the moment in Jersey and Guernsey, the other Channel Island, is the Bishop of Dover. So really, the Steele report should be going to the Bishop of Dover, not to the Bishop of Winchester now. And certainly, if there are any safeguarding issues still to sort out, that's the responsibility of the Bishop of, of Dover. And I guarantee you, if you took a microphone, here's one, there it is. <laughs> if you took, took, took a microphone and stuck it under the face of the Dean of Jersey, there I say even, the Bishop of Dover, and said to them, who is this, who is Episcopally responsible for safeguarding on Jersey today? The answer is the Bishop of Dover. Well, absolutely. So, so there are lots of questions here, lots of stuff that still needs to be answered. And, 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 and you know what? Nothing but an unredacted report is going to keep people happy now. I think this has this has gone on for so long. People want the truth. It, in in our mind, it's so cool that a small Jersey island in the middle of nowhere can have such a, a controversy worthy of Watergate, where the the cover up is worse than the actual crime. Uh, twice now, this is the second report that's not made it to yeah. the, the public. So, yeah. y- well, the first report, the Chorus report, made it to the public, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, well, and and that's the thing. Okay, if it was so important to get these things out into the into into truth, the Chorus report, right? Mm-hmm. The dean said, "Can I see it before it gets published?" Right? Yeah. Can I have time to respond and get ready? The state said that, and the bishop's response was, "No, it, it's been written. It comes out." That's yeah, that's it. Yeah. The exact opposite. Yep. So. No, no, no. This, this a car guy needs to be checked. It needs to be, we, we need to make sure that there's nothing defamatory in it. So when the dean of Jersey last time round says, can we check this to make sure that there's nothing defamatory in it, as in the chorus report, the answer is no, 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 no. This, 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 this has to go out now. Now it's the other way round, and you, you know what? It, it doesn't work. It doesn't stack up. And 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 as you said, it's not that people do things wrong. Right? Everybody does things wrong. Everybody makes mistakes. Right? Even I make mistakes. Right? I know. It's shock horror. Isn't it? <laughs> but it's not the making mistakes. It's the covering up of mistakes. If if that's what's going on, that is 
but it is what's going on here. And given that this, this is about safeguarding and truth and transparency, every single hour that we don't get the full copy of the Steele report, we go, exactly how is this about safeguarding and truth? And, trans 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 and I've been saying on this show, when, whenever we've uh, talked about it, Kevin, 62. I've been saying this has the, absolutely, this has the potential to get really, really messy, and we are we, we are getting very close to that to that point. I think. Well, let's talk about other defamation to be defamed uh, <laughs> stuff in the news. Uh, Pick News did an interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury this week, yeah. and uh, they uh, did an interview, nice lengthy interview, and they they asked the Archbishop, Archbishop, what do you think about gay marriage? And uh, obviously, that's their topic. And yeah. uh, he said, "Great." Um, but where he said it is different than where they reported it. Uh, yeah. What's the backstory? Does Justin Welby think gay marriage is great? No, I don't think he does. Well, well, I, I think he's, you know, I, the line that seems to be coming out of Lambeth Palace has been coming from Justin Welby mm -hmm. for a while. The line that I have defended on this program, much to the chagrin of some of our viewers, okay? I love you guys, <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick, stick by Uncle Justin as long as I can. It's basically... We have gay marriage in the UK now. Let's we just have to get over that and carry on, right? And and and, and manage it. Okay, that's the line that that's been coming out. So we we are we are happy for those people who are happy, but the doctrine of the Church of England still remains: marriage is between a man and a woman, and sex can only take place with, 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 between a man and a woman so okay. he did not say and i read the interview he didn't he did not say gay marriage is great no, he didn't say gay marriage is great he said it's great that our parliament can make these these laws and you know and and, and reflect the will of, of the people even if we disagree yeah. okay but personally i wouldn't have advised him to do an an, an, an interview with the uh, pink news where should because, he do an interview then well it's a lose lose situation okay if he if he comes out and says this is our position, you know, sex is, is only between, you know, you know, it's only rumpy pumpy between a husband and wife. Okay, if that was, if if he comes out and says that, he gets slated as a homophobic bigot. Okay, mm -hmm. if he comes out and says gay love is wonderful and we should bless gay relationships, blah blah, he's just going to get jumped on as a Johnny Come Lately, you know, bandwagon hopper, right? He's not going to win that constituency. Don't even bother. You know, I, I know he, he wants to, you know, build bridges. Go for it. I just, I just didn't think it was a win. It, it, it was a winnable in, interview. He did another in, interview this week on BBC Nottingham, one of the local radio stations, and that was I wouldn't call it a car crash, but it was pretty uncomfortable for him. He kept getting asked about these, 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 these kind of things, and you, you know what? It started really well. Other, other week because he did a fantastic launch of the Church of England's new guide for, for church schools on homophobia, right? And how to tackle homophobic bullying. And you know what? It's a really good guide. It was launched at a Trinity um, School in, in Lewisham, which is run by Father Richard, who as well as being a head teacher is a, is a excellent priest, a fantastic guy. Um, and and he runs this sort of in this sort of three to eighteen school. You know, they have uh, high school, they have primary, they even have nursery. They do all, and and he, he uh, the, the whole school day always starts in worship and prayer and stuff like that. It's awesome, awesome place, really good stuff. He's, he's a great role model. It was, it was launched there. It's a really good guide, right? It's very clear in 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 saying stuff like if you use words like homo or gay as insults, or, or you say stuff like you know that's so gay, right? That's not acceptable. It's not, it's not acceptable to to use someone's sexual orientation as a demeaning thing. And you know what? Yes, absolutely. You don't need Stonewall to tell you that. You know the campaigning group. Let's just let's just go and be be reasonable. At the same time, what the guide says is expressing a theological conviction that sex should only take place between the marriage of a man and a woman. Okay, expressing that isn't homophobic. So it's very clear on those things. It's a great guide. All our viewers should actually go and go and go and read it for what it is. It's really good. So it started off off well. He's doing the right thing. I just think, you know what? It's a no win position because the world wants him just to endorse gay liberation, and he's not in that place yet. Yet, 
ever. Uh, well, well, hopefully never, you know. Hopefully uh, never. Don't say yet. <laughs> that was the thing with Rowan Williams. It was always a yet. Uh, so yeah. uh, we, we want a never. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, you got to be careful who you interview with. And what I've noticed over time, and I've done Anglican TV now for many years, is video doesn't lie. If you want a good, honest interview, um, unedited, you would probably want to do it with some place like Pink Anglican TV. I know if I put pink in my name, I may get an interview. Uh, all I get now, I keep getting emails back. Um, his diary is full. So well, that's fine. You know what? Just book something 18 months in advance. Yes. Yeah? Say, once he got his first free slot, trust us, we'll make it. Yeah, I'm trusting. He, how many interviews did I do with Rowan? Oh, well, well there's my trust. Peter, thank yeah. you so much for episode 99's update. And when, uh, I know the Jersey. It's 100 next time. I know, it's going to be 100. I, a century. I just, I just <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Actually, I know we're going, to do. we're going to have you and your brother on and do a little uh, uh, bounce off each other. That'd be kind of fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for your time. Uh, Alan, it's not often that you and I get to sit down and not talk about Anglican news or tech lawsuits or this person lost that or this church got you know is now right. in the hands of the enemy. We get to talk about something silly this week, and um, some people like to sue, and suing is when you try to bring judgment for civil penalties or money or whatever else against another individual company or uh, corporation. Uh, right. In the news. This week is the largest money uh, suit known to man. Ever filed. Ever right? filed. Tell, tell us what's going on. Okay. Well, we were in the Southern District of New York, mm -hmm. the federal court in New York and Manhattan there, where it just gets all the crazy things. And this is a lawsuit filed by uh, Mr. Anton Parisima, uh -huh. and uh, he is demanded as damages the incredible sum of 2000 decillion dollars. Now, <laughs> that's just because I guess he didn't know there was a number called undecillion. Yeah, he missed it. <laughs> uh, uh, so that would be two undecillion dollars. Because <laughs> then there's duodecillion, tradecillion. But uh, anyway, so he's stopping at undecillion. Mm -hmm. And uh, even so, that number is a humongous number that is very, very hard to visualize just how much money that would be. Uh, for example, it's more than 36 times the total unfunded debt of the United States government of 122 billion, okay, or trillion. Trillion, okay. yes. Yeah, so it's more than 36 exponent. You take that number, not just times it, but raise it to the 36th power, and you get to the roughly this amount that this guy is demanding. And it's a, it's a lawsuit against Au bon Pain, you know, the bakery company. Uh, it's against a, K a Kmart store there in New York. It's against a hospital. It's against the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York. And it uh, wants damages for such things as uh, discrimination, fraud, um, and attempted murder. <laughs> so I don't know whether the hospital did that or the MTA did that, but or maybe Obon Penny choked on a croissant or something. I don't know. But it's, uh, it's kind of an uh, unusual lawsuit. I haven't seen the actual details of it, but what made the headlines was all this. And as I say, if you try to figure out what that is, uh, one good fellow, very good with numbers, calculated if you took all the atoms in the earth of, of elements, mm -hmm. gold, silver, platinum, mercury, all the valuable stuff, and then throw in the calcium and the sodium and the, you know, the silicon, which is most of it, and sell it at market value current market value. So everything in the whole earth, right. including all the all the people, gets sacrificed to pay this guy. Uh, you would pay him a small fraction of it. It would be like only about, yeah, yeah it, that, not even that much. Wow. It would be um, like a, it uh, only amounts to about six, what would be octo, octillion. Uh, and we've got to make it up to undecillion yet. We only make it to octillion with that kind of a, a market. <laughs> well, I, I need to ask you then, because at, at lawyers are supposed to stop frivolous lawsuits as a person in the court. Uh, who is advising this guy to continue? Uh, it, there must be one heck of a contingency fee uh, covered with this. 
Well, right. in this case, he has, as we say, uh, it's a lawyer who has a fool for a client okay. because he's acting as his own attorney. He filed the improper. Okay. And I don't think he could have gotten a member of the bar to sign such a pleading in a federal court because you get sanctioned pretty heavily. I for, don't know. One third of for, this. Frivolous lawsuit. <laughs> you, you most get one third, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, one third of this is quite a bit. You know, that, that, that new Beamer uh, uh, 7 series would be easy to pick up. <laughs> well, but then give, given that you could never collect it, no matter how much you, you got, even if you got a default judgment, you could never collect it. But that another analysis that was done to show how ridiculous this number is, is yeah, suppose Aubonpin wanted to defeat this lawsuit and hire the very best attorney there is, regardless of how much he costs per hour. That would be Ted Olson, who charges eighteen hundred dollars an hour. He's former Solicitor General of the United States, and his his wife, unfortunately, was one of the ones killed in, in the two thousand one plane crash. Um, but anyway, he ch currently charges about eighteen hundred dollars an hour. And so this uh, math, math whiz calculated that if Obama hired a whole earthful of Ted Olson, Olson's seven billion still, of them, yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, and 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 he's billing at that hour rate twenty four hours a day. Uh, seven days a week, it's still you know going to be a small amount to pay in order to uh, escape such a liability. And so then they said, well, what if we create a whole universe of Ted Olsons? Uh, all the known planets and galaxies in the universe occupied with Ted Olsons, each billing at $1,800 an hour for seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, for a thousand years, a whole millennium. That should be enough work to defeat this lawsuit. And they still come out ahead. They still pay less to the Ted Olsons than that than they would have to pay if they lost the judgment. So anyway, as I say, it's a number that is uh, totally outside of the realm of anybody's imagination, and it's uh, except this man who drafted his own complaint. It's interesting when you talk about frivolous lawsuits because when we look at all the money that's been spent on both sides in, the, in these tech lawsuits, uh, churches could have been paid in full for these. I mean. Uh -huh. Pro, do churches built? Um, there's been a, a you know a lot of frivolous done in the this uh, uh, fad yeah. of the last dozen years. Yeah, if if anybody were to get around and do a ratio, ratio analysis of the reward to the risk or the reward to the expense of these church lawsuits, it would be pretty dismal reading. Mm -hmm. um, they have just spent. I'm told, I mean, even when uh, in the lawsuit settled recently in the Diocese of Los Angeles, they settled with St. James and the other two parishes there, uh, he acknowledged that the diocese itself, not the Just Episcopal Church, had spent $8 million on recovering these properties. And they're going to be lucky, you know, St. James is pretty nice, pricey property down in Newport Beach, but even that, if it's it's still a church, and I don't know how much they would be able to get for it, and of course, they can't really do that without saying that, well, we really didn't need that church at all, so we're well, just going to turn it into we, money. We now know they can't sell the church without the approval of the general convention. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. So, thanks. Yeah, I've been paying. Yeah. I've been paying attention, Alan. <laughs> very good, very good. That's right. Uh, California judges say no more. Uh, Dennis Cannon keeps the diocese from selling this property free and clear without the approval of general convention. Quite correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for your time. Episode 100 is next week, so uh, okay. hopefully there's no news. We can just have fun and talk about the last 100 episodes. But okay. knowing the Episcopal Church, they're going to do something crazy. I will see you. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Alan. All right. Okay, George, let's move on to our third and last story. We're going to talk about an evil bishop. Now, we talked about people who, who set standards. We did a, a story with about Ruth Gledhill. She sets a standard for a good religion reporter in the, in the Church of England. We're going to talk about a bishop who can set the standard for being an evil, wicked bishop. Okay, if you're an Episcopal bishop, stop sweating. We're not going to talk about you. There's a better example of an evil bishop over in Serbia. Uh, a gentleman who was a bishop, uh, just recently retired, has been accused of rape, murder, a bombing plot, having a golden room where he had uh, homosexual orgies that were videotaped. And the list goes on. This guy, George, for the last many years has been evil. G give us some examples. Well, uh, Kevin, I need to preface this by yes. saying humbly, <laughs> deeply, I apologize for saying that Jack Spong uh, 
Charles Benison, even Catherine Jefford Shorey have been bad bishops. Compared to Bishop Vasile of Tushla, these are angels. Yes. And, I, and that I'm, I'm being a little arch when I say that, but, you know, sometimes we need to remember that um, these people are not... We disagree with them. Yes. Bishop Vasili is accused of raping and molesting seminarians and murdering one of them who uh, threatened to go public. Now, if you read the story in Anglican Inc., you'll discover that Bishop Vasili has been around for a long time. In 1960, he became a, a police spy for Tito's Secret Police when he was a priest. That's right. And in 1978, when he became a bishop, he continued his spying activities on his fellow bishops and on the members of his clergy and lay leaders in his diocese. So if you went to your bishop with an emotional problem, a spiritual problem, or a bishop, I just, I just can't stand the government, the government would find out. That's right. And he also, uh, when Serbia broke apart in the Civil War, he uh, rallied the troops of Ward Lord... Uh, 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 Mladic, the uh, and in uh, 1995, before the battle for Srebrenica, talked to the Serbian militiamen and said, avenge our blood, the Turks must be destroyed, kill them all, things like that. And that was the battle, of course, in which after the Serbs took the city, 7,000 Muslim civilians were put to death. Mm -hmm. uh, 2013, uh, he was accused of trying to sexually molest some of his clergy, and they complained, and they went public, and he said, no, it's not true. And then all of a sudden, all these videos came out, and photos of him with strippers and gay orgies taking place in a $400,000 room built in his Episcopal palace for pleasure with gold wallpaper and everything. Uh, so a spy, a murderer, a liar, a rapist, a crook, I've not accused <laughs> any <laughs> Episcopal bishop of having reached those heights of infamy. I disagree with you over homosexual marriage. That's a little different than murdering your seminary. A heresy and murder. Okay, yeah, diff different. You know, uh, you know, we've often accused bishops of being heretics and have proved it. Um, but no, none of them have bombed, murdered, raped anybody that, to our knowledge. Now, this is a bishop. If you, if you want to be an evil bishop and you're going to hell anyway, this is somebody that you want to obtain to. This is a, a person who sets the standard. Um, this bishop from Serbia is somebody, you got, I'm going to hell anyway, let's do it big. Don't just go to hell for heresy. Go to hell for killing somebody. I mean, you know. <laughs> so. More. Uh, Kevin, this is our all Calvin all the time show because we really are into the total moral depravity of human beings. Because look, here is a bishop in apostolic succession with valid Episcopal orders. Nobody doubts the Serbians are a true church. Yeah, look at this guy. Yeah. Uh, the uh, morality of the minister, as the articles tell us, have no efficacy on his on his sacraments that he administers. What does this mean to you, the audience? Okay. Yeah, it's a funny story. It's sad. It's tragic. It's tragic that it's in the church. It means that we pray for these people. You need to pray for the congregations in Serbia. They have an evil bit or a retired evil bishop. They're going to have to deal with the situation. Thankfully, he can't have this influence over seminarians and, and congregates anymore. This has to be dealt with in, in the courts, and he's been questioned by police. We need to pray, where is God in this, and how can God be glorified now in Serbia uh, after getting rid of this evil man? And you know, George and I have fun with the story because in contrast to what's happened here in America, it, it, it makes us feel a little better about uh, some of the bishops we've uh, had to uh, do news stories on. But the reality is there's people who've been affected by this evil man, and we need to pray for his victims. And uh, uh, we, we, we want to remind you of that. Kevin, there is a little side link. We may want to bring Alan Haley in here uh, because there was a very famous church property law case in the United States, the Serbian Orthodox case. That's right. Oh, gotcha. And guess who one of the actors in the Serbian Orthodox case was? Bishop Vasili. Bishop Vasili uh, was one of the reasons why the Serbian Orthodox Church in the U.S. wanted to break with the one in Serbia because they accused people like Bishop Vasili of being stooges for the communist government. And the U.S. court said, no, you've got a hierarchical church. We're not going to interfere even if the, your bishop is a, is a stooge of the, of the commies. So, well, 
There, uh, <laughs> we don't need Alan this week. I uh, filled in for <laughs> you, you covered it. <laughs> George, let's close out episode 99 of Anglican Unscripted. Now, for you mathematicians out there, we're one away from 100. And uh, I've been getting emails, how do we send accolades and congratulations and stuff like that. If you want to do a quick 15-second video and send it to us, and uh, you wear purple, I, we have to limit this to, well, at this point, I've received no accolades, so... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> anybody can send them to us uh, send them to anglicanunscripted at gmail.com and we will read some maybe play some during our next episode 100 I hope to have guests that we've had on over the last uh, two years from around the world and uh, uh, it'll be a fun show hopefully there's no big breaking news story that uh, we have to cover next week it can just be a fun show about two people who are narcissistic and sit in front of the webcams all the time talking about Anglican news oh that sounds really sick doesn't it George <laughs> okay, George and I are raising money. We're going to Thy Kingdom Come Conference, where there's going to be the announcement of the new Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America. To get there, we need to raise funds, and I'm budgeting about $1,000 to fly George and I over there. We've reached the $400 mark. We're almost there, so I can stop begging for money. We've told you before, there is no money in religion reporting. That's why we have to ask of our uh, audience to help us. So if you could go to anglican.tv forward slash donate, click the donate button or send uh, a check to the address that's there. That would help us a lot. We're about 40% to our goal for raising money. You guys sent us to GAFCON. Um, you've helped raise money for equipment. It's been a great year for Anglican TV and donations. Please keep them coming. Um, George, let's talk about, oh, the Anglican TV logo hunt. Uh, every week we talk about people who've posted the Anglican TV logo on their website. And two other churches have sent me their links. One is the Church of England in the Cayman Islands. If you look here, you'll see the Anglican unscripted logo. Thank you for posting that. And the other one is uh, Holy Trinity Grampinville. Um, and uh, they also posted that. It's actually from a friend of mine who I've met through uh, my travels. And uh, this is their website. And there's the Anglican TV logo. Want to thank you for that, um, George. How's it been going this week? Well, tough times continue, but you know, uh, folks. I have to say, I am one of the luckiest guys in the world. I've got a wonderful family. I've got a wonderful friend, Kevin Carlson, who has been able to minister to me as I've been going through some personal emotional problems. You know, it really is annoying to have somebody who's right. Uh, when they when they tell you, uh, you've not, you, you're to, not talking to my wife, have you? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. no, it, it's been a tough time, mm -hmm. uh, but God's in charge. And as Kevin reminded me before we started filming this morning, I need to seek the Lord's face, the Lord's will, and all that is going on, and trust in Him. Not try to work it out myself. Not try to manage things, not try to think of the most economic or efficient solution, all of which are important, but rather first look to God. It's true. Um, I, whenever somebody tells me I'm afraid, um, I, I always say, well, where is God in that? And uh, uh, it, great conversations Georgia had. had. We, we built a great friendship over those last two years, and uh, um, uh, it's, it shows in the show. Uh, we obviously get along, have a lot of fun in the show, and uh, we're coming up in episode 100. Uh, I had a big celebration this year, this year, this week. On Tuesday, my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Wow, you guys must really love each other. No, we've proven divorce is not an option. <laughs> no, of course we love each other. Um, you know, it's, it's been a great 25 years, hoping for another 25, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm the boring one in the family. She is the lead engineer on the Black Hawk program for Zikorsky. Uh She keeps the helicopter in the air. And uh, I just sit in front of a webcam and talk about Anglican news. Uh, who's got the exciting job? My wife. Well, you, you know, Kevin, I think her bringing home that forty caliber cannon uh, <laughs> sure. from work 
and training it on you every so often. We'll get we'll get you uh, I, hopping. It's, yes, <laughs> we have a feminism family for some reason. Oh well. So George, uh, please, uh, guys, send in your donations so we can get to uh, the Kingdom Con conference. This has been episode ninety nine. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 99 of Anglican Unscripted. talking to here Ta -da. three two uh, nothing it's in camera see that one on camera idiot three two one welcome to another edition of anglican unscripted this is episode 99 oh, can't believe we got this far you're watching two men four personalities talk about the world of the anglican church i'm kevin Coulson, and i'm george conger and today is May 17th, 2014. All right. Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. You're watching episode 99, which is basically two. Uh, you do the episode part, right? Uh, coffee? No, I do the date. You do the episode. I, I do the episode at the end. Three, two, one. You're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 90. No, it didn't work. <laughs> it's like I've forgotten how I've done this for 98 episodes. <laughs> We're never getting it down 100. Huh? Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is. You're watching. Three, two, one. 